Sometimes I feel the weight of the world fall down on me so heavy. And I need a friendly voice with some good theology. Calvinistically speaking, so I mix a manly drink, Pepsi and shoe polish. And I hit the YouTube link. Don't say hit, that sounds violent. And I feel my troubles all melt away. Oh, ho! Your Calvinist Podcast is filmed before a live studio audience. Welcome to Your Calvinist Podcast. My name is Keith Foskey, and I am Your Calvinist. I'm glad to have you with me today, and I'm excited to welcome back a good friend to the show and uh, the person who I think he's been on now three times, uh, my my good friend David K. Martin. He is an audiobook uh narrator. He is a uh, person who I have had on the show several times. So if you've watched the show, if you've been a consistent listener for the last few years, you've seen David and I together talking. Uh, usually though, we have, we're, we're talking to an author, someone that he has read their book. But today I'm going to be talking to him because the author of the book that he read is no longer with us. <laughs> David has brought B.B. Warfield back to life. And so, David, thank you for being, <laughs> thank you for being with me on the show today. Thank you. Yeah, I love the face you made when I said you brought BB Warfield back to life. And the title of the show is "I Speak Dead People," and uh, the reason for that, of course, is because you did uh, produce an audiobook of an author who is again with the Lord. He's no longer with us. So right away out of the gate, I just want to reintroduce you to our audience and ask you a quick uh, few questions. Number one, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us, uh, you know, where you go to church, how you got into doing audiobooks, and and why you do what you do. Okay, um, I live in, near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, I am a member of Grace Bible Fellowship Church there. Nothing I say here is in any way. Uh, an official statement by them, and I am not an officer or otherwise in charge in any way there. So I'm just telling you my affiliation, not claiming any that I'm speaking on their behalf in any way. Sure. Um, I have been recording audiobooks for, hmm, I think, four years now, but it's getting fuzzy. Um, I have a background in college with a Bachelor of Arts in Integrative Arts from Penn State University, which I jokingly call the Choose Your Own Adventure major. Uh, it's a major which I worked with an advisor to put together a number of things that interested me, including some uh, arts, art history, media, photography, just a bunch of things that we were able to work together in what we claimed was a coherent major, and you know they gave me a degree for it. Uh, I have worked as a, well, I've sold cameras. I have worked as a photo retoucher. I have taught people how to use cameras. Uh, I have worked as a forensic photographer in a crime lab. I have been a social security disability claims adjudicator. I've worked in a call center where I call people up and say, hello, my name is David Martin. And I'm calling with so-and-so. And I'd like to ask your opinion today about some political candidates. Um, <laughs> and most you have one. Now, you have a perfect voice for that one. I've heard that. I've heard those calls before. So, <laughs> and and you know, ninety nine out of hundred people hang up on you, but that one person is one of the people who ends up being part of the. We surveyed three thousand Americans, and they said, um, and uh, then most recently, now I'm I'm an audiobook narrator, uh, and I, the, I really got into it as, as an excuse to read books. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like a great, a, a great way to, uh, to enjoy the book as well as be able to produce it for someone else. And let me ask you a question. Cause I don't think I've ever asked you this before. Do you do exclusively Christian audiobooks, or do you sort of kind of widen yourself out to other areas? I do not do exclusively Christian audiobooks, but I do. Uh, <laughs> I, I, okay. I didn't, I didn't set out to do that. Uh, the first book I recorded was a strictly secular book on interviewing for working at Amazon. 
That's actually my best selling book to date. People are still buying copies of it. Thank you. Uh, helps <laughs> keep the lights on. Um, and I've also done a another book that is on the subject of product marketing uh, a couple years ago. Um, the problem I ran into when I started out, I didn't set out to be a Christian and a narrator of Christian audiobooks. The problem I ran into is I kept finding I would have a crisis of conscience with I, the audition material, or in some cases, even books I was offered, where I just didn't want to read what I saw. Um, mm. I wasn't comfortable reading the language or the situations described, um, and I just didn't want to do it. And so that kept funneling me more and more into the Christian space, and then even more specifically into reformed or reformed adjacent theology for the most part uh because they're even within the christian space there were things i just didn't want to touch so that's sort of where i've ended up if you have a clean secular book on business or history or pretty much any topic and could be fiction as well i would probably be happy to record it for an appropriate fee um but the limitation I've ran into is, you know, the publishing industry, for the most part, has absolutely no limitations on what content they'll publish in terms of you know, sex scenes and foul language and profanity and all that. And I just wasn't comfortable with it. And I wasn't going to go against my conscience to force myself to record something I just wasn't feeling right about doing. Sure, that's great. And and it's uh, awesome that you you have the liberty of conscience to do that. So are, are you is this a self-employment thing? And I'm just curious because I'm curious about how you do this. Is it is this sort of your business and 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 the 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 author contacts you or the publisher contacts you or do you how does that work? Or do you work for I know you come through Audible, so are you employed by Audible? How does that uh how does that work? I'm not employed by Audible. It is all freelance work and pretty much the whole audiobook industry is freelance work. Um, in the case of independently published books, I work directly typically with the author mm -hmm. because the author is the rights holder. The rights holder for a book published by a publishing company is typically the publisher. So in that case, I'm working for the publisher, not for the author. And in fact, it's considered unprofessional within the audiobook industry if you're working for a publisher rights holder mm -hmm. to even contact the author. Because the author has, as part of their contract, given their audio rights, sold their audio rights to the publisher, and they no longer have a say, unless the publisher chooses to give it to the author, in who or how that book is voiced. So it depends on who the rights holder is on the book. For a publisher, it's the publisher. For an independent author, it's typically the author. Awesome. Awesome. And that, and that's interesting to know again. And, and like I said, I, I know we're, we're, I want to get to the plan of salvation. That's, that's really what we're talking about today, but you, you just uh, such an interesting person. And I know I, I want to tell you, my wife was, was excited that I was having you on today because not only are you interesting on the subject of audiobooks, but you're a very funny individual here. <laughs> your, your, your Facebook posts just caused her a lot of, uh, a lot of laughter. She, she, when you became my friend on Facebook, I guess she friended you as well. And, um, she, she's when I told her, I said, yeah, I'm, 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 uh, interviewing David again on the show. And she goes, you mean the meme guy? So, so she thinks, so that's you, you're the, uh, you're the meme Lord of, uh, <laughs> of Facebook. I can't stand that term. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I, but, uh, but I, but I, I do enjoy, I do enjoy stealing, uh, in quotes there and resharing others memes. And I always try to honor the watermark. If there's one there of whoever posted it originally and occasionally come up with a few of my own. Gotcha. Well, here's one you came up with just to uh, just to for the audience's sake. This is uh, uh, one from the office and uh, the people can read it on the screen. But for those who are listening, it says, guess who just ordered Hodge's book on Romans? And then it's one of the characters uh, saying, uh, is it Charles Hodge or Zane Hodge? Now, for people in the audience who don't get that, who's what? what's the difference there? Uh, Charles Hodges was... Uh... Princeton theologian, uh, staunch Presbyterian, uh, very much in the Reformed tradition. And uh, Zane Hodges uh, taught a little later at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. Um, and I don't know as much about him, but a, a dispensational and uh, very much proponent of the free grace movement, from what I understand, versus the more lordship salvation arena that someone like John MacArthur is in. Gotcha. So it would be a much different book on Romans is what you're saying. Dramatically different understanding of what, what Romans means. Not saying, you know, either of them is perfect necessarily, not saying either of them is wholly wrong, but certainly 
I would have a much stronger affinity for and appreciation of one than the other. And um, those are two very different books, both in terms of uh, content and overall helpfulness. Yeah. Now, I you you I asked you about your church earlier, and, and really just not because I know you're not endorsing your church, but just to show you are a churchman, uh, are you? Are, would you consider yourself reformed uh, in your theology, uh, or are you kind of in the middle? Or you know, I, and you don't have to be a Calvinist to be on my Calvinist show, but but uh, but but where where do you land on that? Uh, I am broadly in sympathy with the Reformed tradition. I have been in the past a member of a Reformed Baptist church. The church I am at now does not describe itself as Reformed Baptist. And we can get into a whole other discussion. Um, you know, our Scott Clark would, would be shouting, there's no such thing as a Reformed Baptist. Um, that's, that's a whole other discussion. But the church where I am now um, teaches the doctrines of grace, and it's probably the closest thing you'd find to a Reformed Baptist church that's not a Reformed Baptist church. Interestingly, the denomination came out of a Mennonite background historically. Um, and I don't know all the, the, the history because I came into this comparatively recently, uh, but from what little I've learned about it, uh, it was sort of a, a group of Mennonite men who wanted to be more evangelistic in there and have more of an outreach. And so they ended up forming a, a separate organization, a separate church. Um, and then they were coming from sort of the, you know, the Anabaptist tradition, a very pietistic sort of background. And over the course of a few decades in the 20th century, there was a doctrinal shift as more and more of the young men were being trained and then brought into the church through reformed or reformed-ish seminaries to the point where now uh, it's, it's very close to something like what you would find in, say, the 1689 Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, although we are not again, a Reformed Baptist denomination. Awesome. Well, that leads me to my would you rather question. And people who listen to the show often know that I like to throw out these would you rathers. And uh, the would you rather this week is going to be one that I often ask people uh, when I'm sort of just kind of having a question about, you know, church backgrounds and things like that. And I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Baptist and I'm reformed, uh, even though, like you said, uh, our Scott, our, our, Scott, our Scott Clark, hard to say, <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't allow for me to be a reformed Baptist. So I just say I'm a Calvinistic Baptist. But if let's say you move to a uh, let's say you move to a small town for whatever reason, you, you, you had to move to a small town. And in that town, there was only two churches. There was the Evangelical Southern Baptist Church, but it was not Reformed. Or it was the Presbyterian Church, which obviously uh, would be Reformed, but also would be covenant theology with full uh, understanding of bapti baptizing children and covenant families. And you had to make a choice for you and your family to choose one of those churches, all things being equal in regard to the fact that they're, you know, we're, we're not considering things like size and things like that. We're just saying just on the basis of that theology, would you be more likely to go to the Evangelical Southern Baptist Church and just sort of understand that they, they don't hold to Calvinism? Or would you be more likely to go to the Calvinistic Church, understanding that you're going to disagree on the, the Baptist? baptism issue? I would probably visit both uh, because it's really going to be down to the specifics of how that all shakes out in each congregation. Um, I can sit under preaching that is not explicitly Calvinistic as long as it's not uh, militantly Arminian, <laughs> I guess might be the way to put it. Um, sure. But I'm probably going to be more comfortable with the sermons coming from the Presbyterian pulpit. Uh, I have been a Presbyterian. I was actually baptized in a Presbyterian church as an adult by immersion, long story, not going to get into it here. Um, <laughs> but I have been a member of a Presbyterian church. I have great respect and love for a lot of Presbyterian theology. That's probably as obvious by some of the books I've recorded. Uh, I just think they're wrong about a couple of things, including uh, chiefly uh, well, you know, the proper subjects of baptism. And I, I'm not a I'm not convinced that the Presbyterian form of church government is the best or certainly that it's required by scripture, not that it's necessarily bad. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I think that's helpful. And, and again, it helps the audience get to know you a little bit better. And uh, we're going to go in just a moment and talk about the uh, audiobook that is the subject of today's show, and that is The Plan of Salvation by B.B. Warfield. But before we do that, I have a very quick uh, just message that I'd like to share with the audience. So we'll be back in about one minute. 
Hey guys, I just want to quickly say thank you for watching this episode. And if you're enjoying it, please hit the thumbs up button. If you're not enjoying it, hit the thumbs down button twice. Also, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out. And some of you've asked about how to support the channel. If you'd like to support us, you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash your Calvinist and leave a donation. Most importantly, we want to make sure that everybody who hears this podcast hears the gospel. The word gospel means good news. And that good news has to be preceded by some bad news. And the bad news is this, that we are all sinners. Sin is breaking God's law. So we stand guilty before the Lord of the universe. But the good news is God sent his son into the world to pay the penalty for everyone who would believe in him. Jesus came into the world, lived a perfect life, and he died a substitutionary death for everyone who will believe. And he calls us all to repent of our sin, to turn from our unbelief, and trust in him as Lord and Savior. And if you've never done that, I encourage you to do so today. Now back to the show. And we're back. All right. Well, David, we are uh, talking today about a specific book, and this is the book. Uh, I'll put the, the picture up on the screen here. It's called The Plan of Salvation by B.B. Warfield. And can you tell us a little bit about when this book was written and who B.B. Warfield is for those who may not know? Sure. And I'm going to cheat a little bit here by pulling up on my screen my description of the book that I wrote for Audible, okay. which includes a gross typo. <laughs> it's out there for everyone to see. Uh, and then I'm also going to check Wikipedia quickly for the, the dates here. So I'm, I'm totally cheating on this because I, I'm terrible at memorizing details like this. Um, so the, the the description that I, I came up with for Audible, because this was a this is a self-started project. A lot of times I'm recording something for an author or a publisher who is asking me to record for them. This is something that I wanted to record and put out there myself. So I found a distributor who would put out a, a book that was originally coming from the public domain. And so I had to come up with everything. I came up with the cover art and the description and all that. And I managed to put a typo in the first couple of words of my description and not catch it when I sent it out. So right now on Audible, it says, in five of lectures, in five <laughs> lectures delivered at Princeton Seminary during the summer of 1914, B.B. Warfield used a progressive series of corrections to explain the divine dealing with man, which ends in his salvation, starting with the divide between naturalism and supernaturalism, continuing to sacerdotalism and evangelicalism, and on through universalistic versus particularistic views, Warfield emphasized complete dependence upon God. And then I concluded with what is the closing or nearly the closing sentence of the book. It is only the Calvinist that has warrant to believe in salvation, whether of the individual or of the world, which is a really bold and really dramatic statement. Um, I just quoted it verbatim from the book. Uh, Warfield was a professor of Reformed theology at Princeton Seminary. Uh, he lived from 1951, excuse me, 1851 to 1921. So we're talking back when Princeton was a, a, a bastion of Presbyterian theology, Reformed Presbyterian theology, thoroughly orthodox as we would think of the term today for you know orthodox Presbyterianism. Um, he's coming in the line uh, of before him. Alexander Archibald Hodge, and then Charles Hodge, and then Charles Hodge's son, whom he named for his mentor, Alexander Archibald Hodge. Uh, you know, I just referenced, you know, I referenced Charles Hodge in, in that one meme that you put up there. Um, you know, these are all writers who are, are solid uh, Presbyterians whose commentaries are still quoted today, referenced today, and that sort of thing. Um, they're in, in the 19th century, they're fighting the influx of German liberalism, especially that's that's coming across the pond and getting into this sort of idea that the Bible is more about Jesus teaching how to be a good person. Uh, and it's it's sort of mythologized. Um, one of Warfield's friends at Princeton would be J. Gresham Machen, who's one of his books I've also recorded. Great book. What is faith? Um, and Machen would go on to write the book, The Virgin Birth of Christ, defending the literal virgin birth of Christ, because that was very much an issue um, when you're looking at this sort of liberal theology that was starting to, to encroach there. Uh, Warfield would be the last principal of Princeton Theological Seminary. Uh, after him, he was succeeded by Francis Landy Patton, who would be the first president of the seminary. And then shortly after that, the a more conservative faction of Presbyterians, which included J. Garson Machen, 
would break off and end up founding what is now Westminster Theological Seminary. And in the process, they were also leaving the Presbyterian Church denomination that they were part of and founded what became the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. See, that's a lot of great history. And a lot of people don't realize that because if, if you told someone you were going to Princeton today to go to seminary, you would probably get a pretty strong side eye because people would be thinking that you're going to get a very liberal, very anti-supernatural almost uh, education. And that, that's so, my understanding of it. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. No, 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 no. I, uh, and that's, but to think that that seminary was once a, like you said, a bastion of Reformed theology and solid Reformed theology that's still being quoted today. A lot of people don't realize that. A lot of people don't realize the shift that took place. Um, in fact, in a couple of weeks, <clears throat> I'm going to be interviewing a young man, um, Josh Barzon, who's been on with me before, um, and he's going to uh, come on to talk about the the rise in fundamentalism that happened as a result of the liberal downturn. And there was this sort of divide and it's, and it seems to still be a wide divide that seems to at times be ever widening between the liberals and the fundamentalists and, and what the differences are there. And so it's interesting to look back at that history and to see kind of where, where it all started and where it all shakes out and has sure. shook out over the last hundred years. So um, you, you mentioned that you did this as a self-starter project, and this book is in the public domain. So this allowed you to do this without having to seek any approval or any uh, uh, having to get you know any permissions or anything. You were able to do this and sort of bring this book back to life. Right. Now, and in fairness, somebody else also recorded this and has it on Audible, and I did not realize that when I started the project. I have a list of books that I've... I'll see a book and I'll think, ah, I wonder if anybody recorded that. And I'll add it to my list of unrecorded and I'll just keep updating that list. And I hadn't checked recently enough on this book when I started recording it so that by the time I released it, I found there was a recording that had been out, out for a couple months. And I wasn't trying to step on whoever that person's toes are. Um, um, yeah, it just ended up that I, I didn't realize that there was already an option out there or I would have chosen something else for you know, pragmatic reasons, because I'm not, I'm not interested in splitting my sales with somebody else. I, I want to sell this. I want to make a few dollars by people downloading this and listening to it and having it as part of their library. And so, you know, there's that pragmatic issue. And there's also just the, you know, like, I'm not, I'm not looking to pick a fight with anybody here by recording something that somebody else did. But in God's providence, I didn't realize it was already out there. So I went ahead and I got the approval from the distributor that I was going to use and I recorded it and got it all edited and came up with some cover art and uh, sent it out there with the uh, incorrect audible description and everything, the, the typo in the description <laughs> and everything. Well, I'm sure people understand that. And, and like I said, I, uh, hopefully there won't be any fights picked. <laughs> They'll understand that it, it, th things like that just happen. Uh, in the providence of God, things like that happen, as you said. And speaking of the providence of God, as I was going through the book, because uh, you know, in preparation for today's show, I did get a chance to listen to it. And, and I will say this for those who are thinking of it, it's very accessible. It's only a three hour audio book. Uh, I think wasn't that the total uh, time or is it was, it was relatively short. Uh, yeah, you're right. I just checked. It, it is. Yeah. Right at three hours. So, I mean, for somebody like me, I, I do an hour round trip to the office every day. It's 30 minutes, to the office, 30 minutes home. And so, you know, three days and I've, I'm, I'm through the book and, and, um, and actually I listen, to, I, I listen, and I know this is the, uh, for audiobook narrators, this is the great, um, this is the great sin. So I have to be careful. I listen at one and a half speed and I understand that not, <laughs> oh, I'm fine with that. I'm okay. fine with that. I know some narrators, are, no, that takes away from the artistic, you know, expression of the voice and everything, but I, I'm just thankful to, uh, to be able to speed it up a little bit and hear it. Uh, like I said, so really, it was really less than two days for me to listen to the entire book and, uh, was very encouraged by it. I'm, I, I'm, in fact, I have a few questions for you about it and, um, we're going to kind of talk through what it talks about and, and maybe you and I can banter a little bit about our thoughts, but I was so surprised how much Warfield really shot in on Pelagianism as the, as really the, the, the marking post between the two views. And, and, you know, I've heard Sproul talk about that and I've seen it obviously in, in other, other conversations, um, you know, about Pelagius and, and there's a big 
there's a big argument right now that um, Pelagius has been misunderstood, that he was misrepresented by Augustine, and um, all of those are in, and uh, you, you smile. So I'm assuming you've heard some of these arguments, maybe uh, uh, a little bit. And, and, I, and I'm not by smiling. I'm not saying I disagree necessarily. I'm, I'm smiling because there's always a disagreement about something. And sometimes I'm part of it, sometimes not to my better. OK, well, I, I think that uh, it's I think it, it raises some questions. And this Thursday uh, coming up, I'm going to be speaking at the Y Calvinism conference, and I'm actually going to be addressing um what brought what what was the connecting point between Calvin and Luther? My my title of my message is the Calvinism of Luther, which is a total clickbait uh, title because you know obviously Luther came before Calvin and Calvin, but um but the idea is that Calvin and Luther were joined by a by a a, a fairly un, unified anthropology, and their anthropology was very Augustine, and that is that oh, man yeah. is unable apart from God's grace to do anything good toward God. And so as I was listening to the book, I was hearing so much of that from, from, uh, Warfield's pen, you know, or from your voice, you know, which is, which is echoing obviously Warfield's pen. And so, um, you know, did, did you notice that pick up on that when you were reading through it? And, 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 and did that strike you at all that that was a, the, the main issue? Cause when somebody says, we're going to talk about the plan of salvation, often my thought is we're going to talk, we're going to talk about faith and we're going to talk about how that relates to works and things, but he really didn't, he really got to the heart of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's exactly. That's, um, I, I, obviously I read through the book a couple of times and I recorded it and then I, I partially re-listened to it yesterday and I just, I didn't have time to finish it to listen to it again, but yeah, he's he's going back to Pelagianism versus Augustinianism being the fundamental dichotomy within what would call itself Christianity, and he's saying Pelagianism is outside of Christianity essentially, but he's he's saying within what we would you know people who would call themselves Christian, you're either Augustinian or you're Pelagian, or you're semi-Pelagian, or you're semi-semi-Pelagian, or. <laughs> That was a term I hadn't heard. Actually, that that hearing that in your book made its way into my notes. You, you in fact, I, I just 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 to another feather in your cap. Your your sermon or your your book made it into my sermon last week because I had I had listened to it before the sermon, and so I mentioned uh, just how in depth in, in just a three hour book Warfield was able to dig down really into the depth and say here's the real issues and i was just talking in the sermon about how we're so superficial oftentimes with our faith and 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 men who lived 100 years ago without the advent of internet and computers and all these things we're still able to dig into the minds of these things and really pull out the gold and and silver that we often leave left on the floor because we just aren't willing to go and, and dig so deep and so that's why I, I pointed it out in the sermon but also uh you know i was thinking just it, for my sermon this week i'm going to mention it again that, that that warfield's reference is there's pelagianism there's augustinianism there's semi-Pelagianism, and then what he called semi-semi-Pelagian, <laughs> and I'm not even sure I really understand where the lines would be drawn, but that was a new one on me, semi-semi-Pelagian. Yeah, I, th I think he was saying that's th that was how he was characterizing essentially the Council of Trent, where, where they ended up there as, as being semi-semi-Pelagianism, where there's lip service paid to justification by faith and um, it all being of God. But then there, there's, you start getting back into this issue of works being back added into it and imparted good works. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's that whole mess you start getting into when you, when you look at uh, Roman Catholic theology historically, as well as what it is today, post-Vatican II. And that's a whole realm that I know teensy, teensy, tiny little bit about, and I can't really comment on it all that knowledgeably. But yeah, that he's, he's essentially saying that, that over time, that, the, the church renounced Pelagianism, and then it crept back toward it into semi-Pelagianism. And then it renounced semi-Pelagianism, and then it crept back toward it with semi-semi-Pelagianism, and that's where it got stuck. And oh, wow. Hence, and, and, and that's, that's why, the, and he's saying essentially that's why the Reformation came about. You know, Luther was an Augustinian monk. Luther is trained in the Augustinian tradition. Um, and he's looking at Augustine, and he's reading the Bible, and he's listening to what he's being taught and he's saying these do not add up you know if you look at what augustine says here and you look at what holy scripture says here these 
issues from these other things from tradition and the, the magisterial teaching of the church are not agreeing with what Augustine, a doctor of the church or, or you know, a church father is, is teaching, the founder of my order is teaching, and what the Bible, more importantly, is teaching. Because ultimately, the, you know, the Bible is our standard for everything. And he's saying we, we can't look to the church to reinterpret the Bible when we see the Bible is clearly saying something different. That's that whole issue of sola scriptura, which is one of the, you know, the hallmarks of the Reformation, the five solas. Yeah. I want to read the quote that I do have for my, uh, my sermon on Luther. This was d directly taken from the audiobook. In fact, I, I don't have a, a hard copy of the book. I only have your audio book. Um, but I, so I had to go back a couple of times <laughs> I had to, get, to, to get the well, actual quote, you know, uh, I'll, just, I'll, uh, I'll put in a plug here. This is unsolicited, uncompensated. They don't know I'm saying this, but monergism.org. I believe that's the correct website. Uh, mm -hmm. Monergism has a great PDF of it. That's searchable and easily readable. I did not read from that because if they changed anything and I don't know that they did. But if they changed anything, I didn't want there to be an issue of me not using the original and using their potentially copyright or just otherwise, you know, intellectual property or their, so anything that it's in any way proprietary to them. So I actually used a copy from Open Library. It's a scan from an, an originally published copy. But if you want an easy to read copy where you're not looking at yellowed pages from a sometimes kind of blurry PDF image, Monergism has a, a great copy of it. Oh, that's cool. That's very helpful. I may look that up just so that I can actually, because usually in my notes, even though I don't say it when I'm preaching, I'll quote someone, but I won't say this came from this book or whatever, but I have it in my notes in case I ever have to go back and, and cite it, um, you know, and, and be able to do that. But here is the, uh, here's the actual quote and it's from, from the book, from Warfield's book, it says, quote, the reformation is nothing more than Augustinianism coming into its rights. And so, yeah. again, the Reformation is nothing more than Augustinianism coming into its rights. And, and, and I would agree with that. I would agree that even though <clears throat> there are very many areas where we would disagree with Augustine, the, the heart of the Reformation, which is the, the nature of man and the nature of God, well, we'll say, we'll turn that around, the nature of God and the nature of man, the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man. How do you rectify and reconcile the two? Is it through some sacerdotal church priesthood model, or is it through justification by faith alone and Christ alone? Is that, you know, that's the, that's the heart of the divide. And it goes back to Augustine's recognition that man is unable to do these things. And again, this, this is the heart of the, the issue today, even today, even in the moment where we're at right now, I can guarantee you, Leighton Flowers is either on a video or making a video. <laughs> and I tease Leighton and I'm going to see him in a couple of days. I'm, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to buy his dinner because I'm looking forward to just spending some time talking to him. And I'm going to say, listen, you know, let's, let's have a conversation, you know, but his, his contention is that we have misrepresented uh, Pelagius, that, that Pelagius's position is just not what we have said it is. But then, then it seems as if when he begins to explain his position, it sounds very much like what we have said Pelagianism is all along. So, you know, and, and, and again, I know this isn't really the subject of our discussion, but what are your thoughts on that larger conversation about what did Pelagian really believe? You've, you've read a lot of books, obviously you're a, you're not only a reader, but you're a speaker of, of the written word. Uh, or a narrator of the written word. What are, what are your thoughts on? Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna punt. I'm not I'm not gonna comment other than okay. that. I think you're probably right. Okay. All right. I, I, fair and I'm enough. I'm buttering the post there, but you, you were you were talking earlier about my wonderful voice. I'm allowed to say that I think you're right on that one. Whatever your position <laughs> is, you're probably right. Uh, I just want I wanted to correct myself here. It, it's monergism.com at monergism.org gave me a safety warning. Don't go there. So I didn't. <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> my browser says that's something not acceptable. Um, but uh, monergism.com. And if you do a Google search, you can find there the, the plan of salvation through them, uh, along with an extraordinary number of other wonderful works. Uh, it's, it's such a great website. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, as, as far as the whole Pelagian controversy and all that, I, I don't, I have not read anything by Pelagius. Um, and uh, the little I've read about the controversy, I'm not prepared to say for sure the Pelagius is or has not been misrepresented. I, I guess I would probably come down on the side of thinking he probably has been 
quoted accurately enough or characterized accurately enough that we can see what the problem is with with what he taught. And, you know, teachers that I respect, like Warfield, are, are have looked at Pelagius and, you know, they this is a guy who would have actually read what Pelagius wrote, probably in the original language, uh, and had a problem with it and said, this is this is clearly not accepting the sovereignty of God as taught in the Bible. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's part of the issue. It's sovereignty. It's also that issue of, you know, monergism versus synergism. Do we in any sense, in any way, have any part in saving ourselves? And if there's even an iota of that, then it's synergism. It's not all of God. Uh, you know, it's you get into Ephesians 2, 9 there, where now suddenly you have something to boast about because, you know, God did most of it. You know, God did some of it. God did not. You've got all you know all the different flavors, anywhere from full on Pelagianism down to, you know, Arminianism or Amaraldianism or whatever, where God is doing most of it, but there's a, a tiny little bit left for the individual. But no matter how you slice that, what you end up with is having something to boast about. And so, essentially, Ephesians two nine is no longer in effect, where you're, you're saying, you know, all, all of God, lest anyone should boast. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and my, my thought, and again, I know this again, taking us down a little rabbit hole here and I, and I want to, I, I would wonder how someone would respond to this if they said, well, that, you know, Pelagius has been misrepresented. I say, okay, well, let's just, let's just say that may be the case. Is it, is it not accurate though, to say that Pelagianism has become a term which references something? So divorcing it from the name, we're just saying this is what this is. It's a person who believes that, it, that that man ultimately has a libertarian free will. He's able to do good toward God apart from divine effectual grace. That's what we mean. Call it what you want. You know, a rose by any other name is still a sweet. And it's a fair point, though, about the names, the, the, the person that uh, something is named after, because you know, Warfield gets into that with the whole issue of Lutheranism. He, he talks about Luther's beliefs and writings. And then he basically says, and then came Melanchthon. And then he talks about Lutheran theologians who have, uh, in Warfield's view, basically turned Lutheranism back toward a type of synergism. Um, now, I am totally unqualified to comment on Lutheranism today or Lutheranism during Warfield's time. Uh, I'm not making that accusation of myself. I'm saying that's you know, what Warfield is, is teaching in his in his book there. Um, but he's, he's, he's saying that Lutheranism, as he knew it then in the early 20th century, is not Lutheran. It's not of Luther. It's more Melanchthonism. And that, I tell you what, I, I, I hope it doesn't look like I'm looking away. I'm actually writing a note about that. As you were saying it, I'm like, that is good. What you just said is a perfect analogy to what I'm saying and maybe is something that needs to be said because I'm going to be talking about this in my message. I'm actually going to be addressing the fact that, hey, yeah, um, we, we're connected to Augustine. We have to admit that, right? And therefore, we're connected to the Pelagian controversy with Augustine. And do we know everything that Pelagius ever said or taught? No. And must, I'm sure many of the things that he wrote are no longer with us, just like many of the things that many people have written. You know, very, very few things are kept down through the ages and, and valued to the point where people will keep them and, 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 keep a repository of them for us to have. And so, yeah, we have to, we're limited on what we know, but what you just said, I had a Lutheran pastor say that to me on the show. Uh, it was a uh, uh, Tapani uh, who is a Lutheran pastor in the UK. He said, um, we are Lutheran, but that does not mean that we believe what Luther taught. <laughs> and I thought that's such an interesting way of saying it, but he was right. Lutherans was don't that your, uh, bow tie dialogues episode. It, with it the was, it I, was. I've been meaning to watch it. It's, it's sitting there in my queue along with a million other things that I want to watch or listen to, but sure. Yeah, no, that, that, that's interesting that he's acknowledging that too. I, I, I didn't, I, I know a few Lutherans, but I don't typically talk theology with them. And I didn't know if that's really something that's uh, discussed or acknowledged much within Lutheranism today. Well, he said, uh, he said that their governing document of book of Concord is they re recognize that it, it has areas where Luther may have said something different because in, in his, in his argument was Luther. He said, if you combine everything Luther wrote, he was publishing a new book like every two weeks, like, like he wrote so much and, and that's probably an exaggeration, but maybe not too much of an exaggeration because he just wrote so much, the voluminous writings that came from him. And therefore to, to say, well, Luther believed this 
and come down hard and fast on specifically what he believes sometimes hard because he he had so much that he did it's almost impossible to say for certain in some areas where he would have landed so sure and i wonder too if there's maybe a, a certain pragmatic element there because while luther was great in some areas he was not great in other areas by pretty much any christian measure uh, including his pretty vicious anti-Semitism later in his life, which um, a different book that I recorded actually had some quotes from Luther and, and talks about that a bit. Um, it, it's interesting that it really seems to have stemmed from his disappointment that he was unable to convert the Jews uh, mm. that he knew in his time. Um, it wasn't sort of a, he hated the Jews as Jews. He hated the Jews as rejecting Christ when he presented it. Um now it does that doesn't mean that his his vicious words are okay by any means. Uh it's it's but it's it's sort of a little different from what we think of as typical anti Semitism that we encounter today. But you know, certainly I, I can I can completely understand a, a Lutheran today wanting to disassociate from himself from that. You know, at the same time, I like J. Gresson Machen. Machen apparently was quite racist. Uh I understand that from just from from reading a bit about him that he was opposed to integration at the at the seminary. And he actually fought with Warfield over this. Warfield wrote in support of integration. And Machen, who was his buddy, was at the same time saying, no, that's that's not acceptable. We can't we can't have those people with us. So, you know, you, you, you're always going to have some level of, of feet of clay of your heroes, um, sometimes yeah. bigger than others. Uh, but that's I well, guess that's a whole other discussion in itself. No, and that I love the term feet of clay. You're right. We're we're all, you know, what is it Paul talks about in Second Corinthians? We're all jars of clay, right? We're, we're all we all have uh, you know, the 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 limitations of the flesh and and also our own particular issues that we that we bring into this to to this Christian life and have to deal with. And and, and then, you know, as a Calvinist, I, you know, how many times have I been faced with, you know, well, Calvin did this or Calvin did that, you know, Calvin, Calvin killed Servetus. Uh, that's, I knew it. <laughs> I knew that's, you know, I know that's coming, right? Like, like, like mm -hmm. that. And, and, and so, yes, our heroes are failed. They're fallen. They are uh, imperfect. And um, even though, you know, the, the, the culture of context of, of, Luther's life and Calvin's life and, and, and even, you know, Machen and the rest much different than ours today. Uh, it still doesn't necessarily excuse their failures. It's just a different cultural context that might allow those failures to shine a little brighter than they would today. If, uh, if they existed, they shine yeah, brighter well, in the sense that people see them more. I don't mean shine brighter in a positive way, mm -hmm. but, but they're, they're more, in, more easily seen. I really love what uh, Vody Bauckham said in his uh, ethnic Gnosticism speech at uh, Founders Ministries a few years ago, I think it was. I've quoted it over and over again on Facebook. So if, you, if you're a Facebook friend, you've seen me quote this multiple times. But um, And it's long, and I'll, I'll just paraphrase, but it's something like how racism is the new unforgivable sin. And so if somebody was a racist in the past we're now willing to just completely write them off, say they're completely unacceptable. So for example, Jonathan Edwards owned slaves. Um, it's just a fact of life about him. And although he wrote some good things, he also did some not good things. And he, but he's pointing out that there's a double standard there because sh shortly before he was talking, there had been the MLK 50 conference celebrating Martin Luther King. And he's saying, now, some of these same people are celebrating Martin Luther King, who was a serial adulterer and denied fundamental tenets of the Christian faith, and they're going to celebrate him as a hero. But that Edwards, oh, we're going to unname things that are named for Edwards because he was a racist, and that is unforgivable. And he says, then, then he says, here's a world I'm not willing to live in where before I can quote something that's true and right from a person, I have to go back through their lives and retrace everything they did to try and figure out that I'm certain that they went to heaven when they died. And, you know, and I love that. I think that's, that's very liberating in a good way to recognize that we don't have to try and prove that somebody is a saint in the special sense, or even a saint in the general sense, to quote something accurate that they said. It doesn't mean that there aren't some people that I would maybe not quote. Uh, there are people that I will avoid quoting because I just don't think it's helpful. Yeah. But there's nobody I'm going to say, well, I don't think he was a Christian, so I'm not going to quote him. Uh, you know, he did this particular bad thing or 
even, you know, people alive today, I look at this and, well, I don't like that he has this theology or this doctrine. So there's, it's completely unacceptable for me to quote him or reference him. Uh, I think that's terribly unhelpful. Um, it's just, it's, it's not a workable system. You, you end up with this sort of constant fear that maybe you're going to quote the wrong person. Tomorrow, it might be discovered that this person you quoted was secretly having an affair or secretly a racist or secretly, well, whatever else. Uh, and then everything you've ever quoted from that person is invalidated. Um, I, I was trying to come up with a term for that. And just this morning, I posted it on Facebook. My, my theory for that is that it's epistemological donatism that oh, wow. the, the donatists were in the early like 300s and they had a they believed that the those who had left the faith and apostatized and come back could not it, properly administer the sacraments and because the sacraments were dependent upon the faith of the administer the person administrating them or celebrating it depending on your, your terminology um and that's a that was something that was rejected by the you know, what we probably would now call the, the Catholic Church or the Universal Church then, and has been rejected by most Christians down through the ages, the, that if your baptism was administered by somebody who turns out to be an apostate, that the baptism is invalid. Well, Roman Catholics don't believe that. Eastern Orthodox don't believe that, as far as I know. And most Protestants don't believe that, because it's not the faith of the person administering it that matters. It's either or both of the church, if you're in a more sacerdotal system, you're looking at the, the, the authority of the church to do it, or the faith of the individual, if you're in an you know, anti-sacerdotal system, or some combination, depending on how you, you parse all that, that matters. It's not specifically the faith of the person doing the administering it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That, so that, that's, that's, that's donatism, <clears throat> which we all reject. And if we all yeah. reject donatism, we should reject epistemological donatism. And epistemological donatism is that if an idea comes from somebody who's not faithful, we can't quote or use that idea. Mm. That's good. That's a good thought. Yeah. And uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully people will hear that and, uh, and apply it because that's good. That's good thinking. All right. So I want to pull up this uh, uh, to, to get, going back to the book. I want to pull up this chart. And for the sake of the for those who are listening, you won't be able to see the chart if you're listening to the podcast. But um, if you want to go over to our YouTube page, you can go over there and you'll be able to watch the video. And we're going to look at the the way that Warfield. Now, is this his chart? Did he create this chart or was this well, something that the someone else. It's did. published in his book. Presumably he signed off on it. I imagine he probably hand wrote this and then somebody typeset it for him. Um, the, the book is, is from a set of lectures and <clears throat> excuse me, today, this would probably be a handout at the first lecture. We would probably photocopy this or print off a bunch on our laser printer. That wasn't a thing at the time. This is before not only photocopiers, but before mimeograph or spirit duplicators or ditto and all that. And I doubt he paid somebody to typeset this and print it out. These are probably something that after the, the his lectures were transcribed, his notes were transcribed, that he came up with something along this line and then gave it to his publisher and they typeset, I'm guessing. And I chose not to include this, which is actually kind of a, I won't say a cardinal sin, but it's kind of a no-no in the audiobook world unless the information occurs elsewhere in the book. And I cannot guarantee that every bit of this information occurs elsewhere in the book, but I just didn't think it would be helpful to try and read this vast matrix of different ideas and subcategories and the order in which these different things occur. So I left it out. I, I admit it. I just plain left it out. Okay. All right. But we have it now. We can look at it now. But yeah. You can look in, excuse me. You can look at it on the screen. Um, you can find it for free at uh, open library. I believe it is. Uh, I think there's probably, well, I don't know if there's a copy included in modern distance version or not. I don't know if they did it or not. But you can also Google it. You can find Warfield, the Order of Decrees chart, and I think you can find it that way. Uh, it's it's kind of helpful, but it's very technical, and narrating it would have been very, very dry. There, there are ways to narrate almost anything. And if you've got a Venn diagram, and the, the diagram is iron and men. And so on one side, you in one circle, you have a car, and the other circle you have a person and in the middle overlap, you have Iron Man. Okay. You know, and, <laughs> and there, there are ways to describe that. You can say, well, we had the, 
And so let's consider these categories. We have the category of man. An example of man might be Keith Foskey. And we have categories of iron. An example of iron might be a car. And we have an overlap. And in the overlap of iron and man, we might have iron man. Okay, so, you know, there, that's a super simple version. There, there's a way to narrate almost any diagram, but at some point it becomes not worth it. Sure. And this, I mean, like I said, the, 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 the chart is really uh, very extensive note wise. Uh, and if you didn't listen to the book or read the book, it might even be almost impossible to sort of, maybe not impossible, but it would be very difficult for the, the average person to just look at this and make heads or tails out of it. Because the first divide is the divide between the supernatural and the natural. And under the natural, um, you know, you have the uh, the Pelagian position, which is on the far right, uh, and um, the the uh, on the on the supernatural, you have on the far left the particularists, and then of course that being the Calvinistic particularists. And so the the, the again the divide is between the as we talked about earlier, the divide is between the 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 those who would hold to a Pelagian or synergistic or however we want to say, or, or, or naturalistic rather, not even synergistic, but a naturalistic view and a Calvinistic particulars view. And, and the end of the book is, and you, you quoted it earlier, that Calvinism is the only one that makes sense of this. And, yeah. and, 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 and that sounds like a bold claim. And some would say it sounds like a prideful claim, but yet that's the reason why many of us are Calvinists is because we feel like there's, there's so much data when it comes to how we're dealing with this question, the question of man and his abilities and God and his sovereignty and the, the lack thereof of our abilities and the, and the, and the extent of God's sovereignty, all of those things come into question and you, and you have to start categorizing some things. I heard a Lutheran pastor this last week as I was preparing for my Luther message. He said that, uh, you know, the Calvinist wants to talk about divine decrees. Well, we don't talk in categories like that. That's what he said. He said, we don't speak in categories of divine decree. And I said, oh, okay. Um, well, again, it goes back to a, a rose of any other name, right? It's still going to, what, what do you call it then? If you don't say divine decree, you still got to say God did something or God chose something. But um, that's just, as I'm looking at this, it, it is, it's trying to flesh out that which is logical. Would you agree with that? That that means he's trying to make a logical yeah. argument. Yeah, you know, you've got two axes here, and essentially the the x axis, left right, is between the the more God does everything axis and the God does maybe not nothing, but God is essentially not really part of the actual salvation. He's just sort of the creator, um, and then on the the y axis, up and down. It's not actually degrees, but it's it's an order. It's a, it's a logical order, and that's part of what makes this chart a little bit confusing the first time you look at it, because on the one axis you're you're, you're looking at things that are in opposition. You're looking at Calvinism on one side and Pelagianism on the other side, but on the other axis you're not looking at things that are in opposition. You're looking at things that are in succession. So mm -hmm. there's a logical succession where the Calvinist is a supernaturalistic view. He is evangelical. He is particularistic. He is consistently particularistic. He is, in Warfield's view, the best Calvin, Calvinist is infralapsarian. And that means that what he believes is that first, there was a permission of fall equaling guilt and a corruption and total inability of man. And then there was an election of some men to life in Christ. And then there was a gift of Christ to redeem his elect and ground the offer to all. And then there's, excuse me, I, I misspoke there. Gift of Christ to redeem his elect and ground offer to all. And I'd actually have to reread his exact words in the book where he's talking about that, see what he's using by ground offer to all. I think he might be talking there about just the idea that there is a general call um, that we offer we offer the we we offer the call to all. Uh, Spurgeon always Spurgeon would talk about how since we don't know who the elect are, we are called to offer the gospel to all, and then the elect will sort themselves out, or rather, God will sort the elect out of them. But we're not looking at the sort of you know, hyper Calvinist view of we got to figure out who the elect are so we can preach the gospel to them. Uh, anyway, that aside. So then after that, the <clears throat> the gift of Christ to redeem his elect, ground offered all. Then there is the gift of the Holy Spirit to save the redeemed. And then there is sanctification of all the redeemed and regenerated. 
And all of that is meant as a logical succession, um, not necessarily a temporal succession, um, even though they, some of them uh, will happen after others. But the point is that the one follows the other. And that's where you get into that somewhat subtle and theologically nitpicky difference between infralapsarianism and superlapsarianism, which he does talk about there. And I think he makes a very compelling argument for infralapsarianism. But yeah, if, if I could uh, just for a moment, because yeah, you're, please. I appreciate you're, you're going through it and, and you're being very helpful, but I want to say this as a person who has sort of at times struggled even with defining that. I think this book, if, if, if somebody has struggled with where you stand on the supra versus infra lapsarian view, I, I had always kind of felt like the infra was the position that I was at least arguing for as far as logically from, you know, the fall, you know, and, 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 and the, 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 the choice was God choosing to elect those who were fallen and leaving some to their own sin, right. That that would come after the, the, the decree of the fall. Um, but with that, I think this book does a tremendous job of helping to explain that and make the argument. So yeah, I, I, I think uh, I would agree with you that that's definitely where he would land, even though that's not the farthest to the left, it's the, it, on the chart, but it still uh, 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 seems to be where he, his argument's coming from. Yeah. There, there are a few things that aren't on the chart. There's nothing specifically labeled Arminianism on there. Um, mm -hmm. I think he has, um, he has Amaraldianism, but not Arminianism, at, you know, and, and the two are not the same, although they're certainly related. Um, you know, and, and, and yeah, if we're looking at what he likes the most or what he believes truly, um, you know, Warfield, it's pretty clear from the book, believes in infralapsarianism, but he doesn't put that all the way on the left. He finds it more logical in the ordering of things on his chart to put it second from the left right after superlapsarianism. Um, and that's in part because of how, how he's laying out these, this, all these order of decrees showing how one comes after the other. He's saying, if you, if you were trying to line these up in a logical sequence, You'd, you'd probably start with the superlapsarian view here, and then you move over to the infralapsarian view, where you've switched the, the basically switched the top two boxes. You've switched election of some, and then you, with the permission of fall and guilt, corruption, total inability, where you're saying that superlapsarians are teaching that election occurs before anything else, and infralapsarians are saying that the fall comes first, and then there is the election of some. And he just thinks it's better. He, he presumably that thought it made more sense to put the superlapsarians there on the left, leaving himself at the second from left position. Yeah. Again, I, I, I could see this chart again, being super helpful just, to, j just by, you know, along with reading the book, but having the chart, if I was, if I were teaching on this subject, I'd, I'd want to give everybody a copy of this. And if you could um, just, just for the sake of the audience, because um, it, again, it may be somewhat hard for them to read all of this. And, and you did such a good job of taking us through the uh, infralapsarian view. Could you take us through the Pelagian view? Because again, this is what his view of Pelagianism was, regardless of what the modern argument is about what Pelagius believed. What is he saying Pelagianism taught there? Sure. Yeah. He's saying Pelagianism is, first of all, naturalistic versus supernaturalistic. In other words, it's focused on the natural world rather than focusing on God's sovereignty. And then under Pelagian, he's putting, first of all, the, the order of decrees, as, as he's lining up here, is the gift of free will by virtue of which each may do all that is required of him. Mm. So he's, he's talking about libertarian free will, to use that term, which is a very helpful one, I think, um, you, you mentioned earlier. He's talking about pure libertarian free will. Man is free and able and competent to do all that is required of him because of the gift of free will. And then subsequent to that gift of free will, there is the gift of law and gospel to illuminate the way and persuade to walk in it. And law and gospel is a wonderful subject and a whole other issue under Reformed theology, but that's, you know, Reformed theology, just the, the, the person who likes Reformed theology me rebels at this first of all, conflation, and also this idea that they are, they're simply meant to illuminate and persuade and nothing else. But he's saying the, the Pelagian believes the gift of free will, and then there's the gift of law and gospel to illuminate the way and persuade to walk in it. And then there was the gift of Christ to expiate past sin and to set a good example. And so Christ gives 
payment for, or takes away in some way the past sin and provides a good example for us. And then there is the acceptance of all who walk in the right way. And so this is, again, talking a libertarian free will kind of point of view where certain people choose to accept it and certain people choose not to, but certain people choose to accept it. And those who, who accept it will walk in the right way. And then there is continuance in right doing by voluntary effort. So you're, you've done, you, you've justified yourself and now you're sanctifying yourself essentially. And it's all, it's all centered in man's will. God does something. God is acknowledged to exist and to have done something, but it is, it's almost monergistic in man's action other than acknowledging that God's out there and he's done some stuff like sending Jesus as a good example, but it's synergistic veering over toward a monergism of centering salvation in man. Well, completely entirely the opposite of a monergism of Calvinism centering salvation entirely in God. Mm. Now, the next one over, you mentioned it doesn't say uh, Arminianism specifically, it, but it does mention it, the remonstrance. The, rem which the remonstrance, would... right. Yeah, exactly. The The remonstrance were the followers of Arminius at, uh, who wrote the five points of Arminianism, the, the, you know, the five points of remonstrance, which the what we now call the five points of Calvinism were written in response to you know, the whole synod of Dort and all that. Um, so the, the, the remonstrance, uh, well, yeah, that, that stands in for Arminianism there essentially. Right. Yeah. Uh, that, and that's, I just wanted to mention that. No, 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 you don't have yeah, to. You're, just, well, you're right. I, I, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that, but you're exactly right. That's, that's it. It's standing in for, instead of the category of Arminianism, it's using the category of the remonstrants who were in fact followers of Arminius. And you get into the discussion then, were they accurate followers of Arminius? Was Arminius an Arminian, you know, again. Yeah, was, again, that's that's a good point. And, and I just think it's interesting that Warfield put that also under the naturalism. So because, yeah, yeah because Arminianism would be differentiated from Pelagianism. But it would be, according to most uh, reform scholars that I've read, they would see it as semi-Pelagianism, still a form, but but just not full Pelagianism. And they would argue that that was um, condemned at the Council of Orange, this uh, in in France. So the, that 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 I'm going to I'm going to be mentioning that in my message as well, because we see not only Pelagianism condemned. Um, uh, or th during the time during the lifetime of Augustine, but we see even the semi-Pelagianism, which which was the the next evolution of that, was, was condemned not by an ecumenical worldwide council, but but a local council did condemn it, uh, you know, and that's the Council of Orange. And so we see these things. We see the Church recognizing Augustine's accuracy and how he is describing the nature of man. That's 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 my point. And it's just interesting. I think that Warfield puts it in the category of basically they're both in the category of naturalism. Yeah, I, I remember seeing a lecture by R.C. Sproul in which he's describing Arminianism as semi-Pelagianism. He's just conflating the two. And I think he's talking historically there, um, historical Arminianism. I, I think it's probably fair to say that many people who are in the broad, generic, non-technical category of Arminian today are not tightly aligned with what the, where the remonstrants were. Um, uh, I think it was, uh, I want to say it's Phil Johnson who has said that uh, every Arminian is an inconsistent Arminian because he'll pray for the salvation of his brother or something like that. Um, sure. And, and so, you know, there's this, you know, certain, there's a tension there and an acknowledgement of the sovereignty of God that uh, in, 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 in changing the heart um, that might not be as clear in the remonstrance view it that Warfield categorizes as a naturalistic one where it's really it, it's it's of man um is is essentially what he's saying there um so yeah i i, th I think that's uh i think that's a good point that warfield is, is putting at least classical arminianism or the arminianism that he knew a hundred years ago 120 years ago um when he was preparing these lectures in in the category basically of semi-pelagian almost you know, sort of pelagian but not yeah, exactly. 
I, I, I want to, uh, we're going to start drawing to a close. We're, we're right here at the hour mark. And I appreciate you giving this time to the audience. And I hope that this is, I, ho- I hope that people hear me when I say this. One, this is a great book to get. I hope you get David's uh, audio book. I hope that you uh, learn from it as I have and be able to apply it to your own understanding of, of Christianity and, and, and the plan of salvation. But I, as, I, as I'm thinking through one final thought, I mentioned in my sermon that we need to think deeper. We need to be willing to mine. We need to be willing to, you know, to go down and look for the gold and the silver and not just be satisfied with the surface level things. Um, do you think that there's any validity at all? And I, and I, and, and I know this may be like an odd question, but I, I've heard a lot recently. I've been looking at a lot of Lutheran scholars and a lot of the things that I'm hearing and a lot of things I'm reading, it seems as if they would say that the, the Calvinist does too much to try to make things logical, and they're not willing to simply be be willing to accept some a little bit of mystery. And 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 it and and and, and I don't want to mischaracterize my Lutheran brothers. I, I'm very I have dear friends. I'm very I'm thankful for Hans Feeney. He and I have been working together doing some things lately. Very thankful for the guys who are on my show. So I'm not trying to misrepresent them. But like for instance, when we talked about the table. Right, they're they're very convinced that it's the the body and blood of Christ. But then when I ask them about transubstantiation, it's like they they don't believe in transubstantiation, but they believe it's the real presence, and they're they're willing to have some tension there in what they mean, and and not necessarily try to explain it uh, with such w- with such definitive terms as transubstantiation and substance and accidents and things which are described in Roman Catholicism. And when it comes to things like they will say faith is a gift and God is sovereign over who he gives the gift of faith, but yet they still believe in a universalistic view of uh, the ability of man to be saved. And so there, there, it seems like there, there's some there's some areas where I would say Calvinism is more consistent. Obviously, I believe as a Calvinist, I think it's fair for me to say that. That's why I'm a Calvinist. I think it's more consistent. They would say we're too logical. They would say we're trying to we're trying to reach beyond the veil. We're trying to look in places where we're not supposed to look. And the Bible does say that the things that are secret belong to the Lord. <laughs> so what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that as Calvinists, we go too far in our seeking of a logical answer and maybe to the point where sometimes we're maybe in, in danger of even misrepresenting God because we've tried to make him logical from our perspective. And so that's a, kind of an odd question maybe, but let's we'll hear your thoughts on that. Well, I'd say your, your last point there is the most important one. Do we, are we in danger of misrepresenting God? Because there can be, can there be anything worse than misrepresenting God? Um, and so that would, that's absolutely the fear we should have, the concern we should have, you know, a wholesome, legitimate fear. Um, I, I, I can't say for sure. Uh, you know, I, part of it might come down to, to some degree to an individual's personality or general frame of mind, how much they're willing to accept mystery. Um, you know, so it, it was funny. Somebody had said to me uh, years ago, you know, you, you talk to Lutherans, they're just going to say everything's a mystery. And I got into a discussion with, with a Lutheran relatively recently uh, and asked him a question. And within the, within a, you know, a paragraph or two, it turned to, well, this is a mystery. Like, <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I get it. Like, and, and in fairness, there are things in the Bible that are a mystery. Um, I don't think it's wrong to try and understand them, but it might be fair to say that sometimes we go too far in trying to explain them. Amen. And I, and that, I think that was a very gentlemanly answer. <laughs> that was very, very, I think you're right. I think to, to say, yes, there, there was certainly, uh, we, we want to understand them, but we're not always going to be able to, we're not always going to be able to have, uh, not, not, not always going to be able to figure everything out. Well, David, I want to thank you for coming on the show today, uh, sharing with us again, your golden voice. Uh, I always <laughs> look forward to hearing Boy, thank it. You. Yes. And, uh, and, uh, again, tell people how to contact you if they're interested. I see your, your, uh, your website is davidkmartin.net, uh, and people can contact you if they're interested in their audiobooks and things like that. Yeah, I, I have a contact form on there. Uh, it goes to my davidkmartin.net email address. Uh, if you email me there, I'll probably email you back from Gmail though, because, uh, I found that several major service providers don't seem to like my web host and they think that I am a spammer. And so when I try and send email from that uh, address, it uh, sometimes gets rejected. So I might email you back from a different address, but you can contact me there by by going to davidkmartin.net. I have some samples. 
I should probably update those. I think it's been a you know a year or two since I put them out there. Uh, there's a sample. I think there's one on there from uh, it's either Will Dobby's book, and we, you and I were talking. Mm -hmm. I uh, think about with Will Dobby, or it might be Matthew Ever. It might currently be Matthew Everhard's book, and we talked together about Matthew Everhard. And you also had uh, Joshua Barzon on. He was talking about the uh, King James um, controversy, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah, were well, yeah, you so, on, you were, you were on that show yeah, too, weren't you? I think I was on that one too. So I think that's because because I recorded his his very short book on that subject. So I think that's three previous times that I've been on. Uh, anyway, uh, so so yeah, davidkmartin.net is where you can hear a few more samples of my voice, uh, including a nonfiction sample or excuse me, a fiction sample. If you want to hear how I would handle that, uh, if you're a Christian author who is willing to spring for having an audiobook made of of your uh, work, I'd I'd be interested in talking about that. Amen. Well, thank you, David, for being a part of the show today and for continuing to be a good friend and a, and a person that provides a few laughs every once in a while to my wife. So thank you from her as well. <laughs> I'm glad I'm a joke to you. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. All right. Well, again, I want to thank you all for being a part of your Calvinist podcast today. It is, uh, it's a joy to do the show and to get to speak to people like David and uh, to get to do so, hopefully, as a way to encourage and to educate you and to point you to good resources. I want to also remind you that we have plenty of other videos on the channel. So if you want to, you can go and check those out at calvinistpodcast.com. Please hit the subscribe button. It really helps us out. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up button. If you didn't like it, hit the thumbs down button twice. I want to thank you again for listening to Your Calvinist Podcast. My name is Keith Foskey, and I've been your Calvinist. May God bless you. It's your Calvin's podcast with Keith Bosky. Beards and bow ties. Laughs till sunrise. It's your Calvin's podcast with Keith Bosky. He's not like most Calvinists. He's nice.